live stream the webinar. Okay, just setting it up. I've never been live on Facebook. <laughs> I've done it a few times. I did one in Waitrose car park and I was like, what am I doing? Live. Okay, I think we are live. I'm going to put this down. I've done it a few times. Oh, I can hear myself. I did one in my car park and I was like, what am I doing? Okay, well, no. Okay, I think we are live. I'm going to put this down. I've done it a few times. Oh, I can hear myself. I did one in my car park and I was like, what am I doing? Okay, okay, so I'm just going to bring that volume down there on the Facebook one. Okay, guys, we are live. I'm so excited. We are joined by Sarah Trimble and we're going to be talking about all things to do with nutrition. I'm so excited about this. I woke up this morning and I was just so excited to sit down with you and just have a chat and, um, and talk about it. It's like my favorite subject, talking about food and health and nutrition. So I'm just so grateful that you've given us your time today. So thank you so much. No um, so Sarah, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, um, my name is Sarah Trimble. I'm a nutritional therapist based in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, I have developed over my years as working as a nutritional therapist, a real interest in um, particularly female health, um, how nutrition and a good diet can make huge changes for women's health. Um, and then as a result of my own personal experiences, that's developed into a real um, uh, sort of interest in how diet and nutrition can support fertility when you're trying to conceive, how best to have a healthy pregnancy, um, and then obviously post-pregnancy. Um, and obviously now I'm getting very interested in how um, diet and nutrition is going to support like family health um, and children's health too. Um, yeah, so just really passionate about it. I've done quite a lot of work over the years with um, some fertility um, charities, particularly the Fertility Network. Um, and worked with some supplement companies in developing supplements as well. So um, a broad spectrum of, um, of interests within nutrition, but it really comes down to, like, like you said, it's just about the food. And like, I think it's just fascinating the power of food in rebalancing our bodies and supporting our health. And I think that's the, the one thing I want to share with my clients overall. Yeah. To sum it up in one sentence. Yeah. And we were saying just before this went live that I think for a lot of people, when they're thinking about having a baby or when they're thinking about getting pregnant, this for a lot of people is when that journey starts because you really are trying to be the healthiest version of yourself and you're you're no longer thinking mm -hmm. about yourself anymore, which is strange really. Mm -hmm. We should be thinking about this when it's just ourselves, but we don't. It's when we're thinking about you know having a baby that we really start thinking about everything that we're consuming to make sure that we put what we're putting into our body is actually what it says it is I don't know if I ever read the back of a packet before I decided to get pregnant yeah and then, and then all of a sudden I was flipping the backs of my packets and looking yeah. at what the ingredients were and really interrogating exactly what was inside everything I was eating for sure and it's also probably when you're trying to get pregnant or you are pregnant and you discover you're pregnant it's probably the easiest time to make big changes because you just realize overnight that it's not just about your health it's about your child's health and your yeah. family's health and I know like I had always struggled to completely give up coffee and yeah. <laughs> like I love my like one coffee a day and even just when I was trying to give it up that was never going to happen and like overnight it was just like like no more caffeine that's out the window completely and you know um you're, you're much more willing to sort of spend money on you know better nutritional choices um you know you prioritize spending on those things because I think you want for yourself like you're saying you want to be the healthiest you can be and when you're trying to get pregnant if you think about it and um, you, you're trying to create healthy cells in your body like basically down to a cellular level you yeah. want every single cell in your body and your body to be producing healthy cells. So like, you know, that's a big ask. And, you know, to be able to do that, you have to change your diet. There's no, uh, and, you know, make lifestyle changes. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. I mean, people with the healthiest diets, you know, yeah. there's still like, I, I still have changes to make and I'm a nutritional therapist. So, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's there, you know. Yeah, it took me about six months to get pregnant with Daisy with my first. Um, I don't know if this is too much information, but it did get to a point where I was like, this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. And then mm -hmm. it was when I got really conscious about what I was consuming that there was a shift. And it was when, especially as 
we gave up alcohol which was a big mm -hmm. a big uh, game changer if I'm honest mm -hmm. but it's when you sort of start becoming more conscious of what you're putting into your body that all of a sudden you know it it didn't take us as long it once we became more aware so it, it what I'm trying to say is that it can have a huge impact it, it can't be underestimated mm -hmm. I think when you're looking to get pregnant yeah and really what we should be thinking of is even like you know before you even start trying it's a we would always recommend like a three-month period of getting the body ready because it takes three months for healthy sperm to um or new sperm to develop in the body and three months for your eggs to come to maturity your follicles to mature so if for three months before you basically even start that trying process yeah. you're focused on your nutrition making sure you're getting all the key nutrients that the body needs that means that when you start trying from the get-go you're already in a better place you're healthier and I, I I do work with a lot of clients who are maybe you know very conscious of time for various reasons maybe their age and they're like you know they don't want to wait three months to kind of get their bodies ready and I always say right yes you're going to be three months older but you're also going to be three months healthier. You're going to, your body's going to be in a much healthier place. Your eggs, your, your cells, your, your reproductive cells and your reproductive organs are going to be healthier. So, you know, even just taking that step back and taking that three month period to prepare, even mentally as well, it can be quite helpful. Um, and I think to, to, to bear that in mind is quite important. Yeah, I didn't know that, Sarah. That's such a good point. You know, they mm -hmm. talk about, I mean, I knew I knew about taking folic acid three months before I got pregnant. That's mm -hmm. something I did know. But I didn't know that I should be sort of preparing my body to mm -hmm. conceive. Like that never even entered my mind. I didn't even, I didn't even think that. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. And it's so, it, you're right, you know, it, you've just got to get your body into the healthiest place that it can possibly be. And that's just the best that's the best time to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's start. I've got loads of questions, Sarah. So let's crack on. So let's sort of, I think a lot of the questions that I got from the job forms were, mm -hmm. um, were about trying to conceive, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people perhaps are at a point where they're thinking of wanting to get pregnant. So obviously that's really valuable what you're saying in regards to that three month period. But in terms mm -hmm. of your diet, for those three months mm -hmm. what, what should you be looking at what what changes should you be looking to make well as you said definitely cutting out alcohol as much as possible not not just even in the the kind of um sort of days between trying to conceive and waiting to see if you're pregnant obviously that's very important that there's no alcohol consumed because you don't know if you're possibly pregnant or not so very important that there's no alcohol but um, are consumed in those days, you know, in between ovulation and then maybe whether your period arrives or not. Um, but also throughout the month, you want to keep alcohol intake to a minimum because alcohol is a big depleter of nutrients, specifically like the folic acid, um, some yeah. of the nutrients that our body needs for a healthy conception, for healthy cell um, production, alcohol will deplete. So we have to be very aware of, of your consumption of alcohol. Um, reducing caffeine quite significantly even if it's not cut out completely before you conceive really keep it to a bare minimum and if there is an unfortunate um, any history of miscarriage I would be cutting caffeine out completely because there is unfortunately a link there between um, caffeine intake and, and miscarriage. Um, I had no idea about that. Yeah in terms of dietary um, sort of a dietary pattern that you might be looking at or, or like a kind of a dietary approach that you might want to look at, you know, either preparing your body to uh, try to conceive or you're already trying to conceive. Um, I always advise looking at um, reducing your sugar intake. That's really, really important. Um, Why is that important? Why is that important? Because there's a really significant link between high blood sugar. Um, so when we eat sugars or even um, refined carbs like white bread, you know, white crackers, lots of white rice, pasta, you know, very, lots of a very carb heavy diet. Um, all those foods are broken down into sugar and released into the bloodstream, um, leading to high blood sugars and high insulin production. Okay. So there's a significant link for both men and women now with um, high sugar, um, high blood sugars, high insulin production and reduced egg and sperm quality. Um, so we know that through a lot of really good research. Um, in fact, yeah, cutting out your sugar is probably just as important as cutting down on the alcohol as well. Um, and then for women with PCOS, 
but the, I, yeah. this relationship between um, blood sugar and insulin um, and reduced fertility is even stronger because women who have PCOS are actually insulin resistant. So their bodies are even more sensitive to fluctuations in blood sugar. Um, so it's really, really important. But even if you don't have PCOS, really cutting out your sugar and swapping your carbohydrate choices for whole grains. So rice becomes maybe brown rice, um, brown pasta, eating potatoes with the skin, um, you know, oats are a great choice. Whole, whole grains all the way is, is probably the, the way to eat the skin. Mm -hmm. So then when you're eating them with the skin, you're getting a higher fiber intake. So right. the release of release of kind of sugars from the potato is going to be slower. So you're going to end up with like a reduced um, spike of, of blood sugar after eating the potatoes and actually also eating potatoes cold. So like a potato salad, if you're a real potato lover and you're fine, you would find it hard to kind of. I am a potato like, lover, Sarah. I yeah. am a potato lover. I was brought up on this stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So eating potatoes cold, so like in a potato salad, yeah. um, is a really good way to eat potatoes and have a which will have a lower impact on your blood sugar. So when you eat when potatoes um, are cooked and then cooled down, they release starch and that actually um, makes them harder to digest, takes them longer to digest. So your, your release of sugars from those potatoes will be um, reduced and you won't have the same blood sugar spike or insulin spike. So that's a really good kind of tip. Okay. If you're, you know, kind of trying to change your diet. That's amazing. So yeah. alcohol, caffeine, sugar. And then, and my, so like my other real, real key key takeaway when you're trying to conceive or preparing your body conceive is to increase your antioxidant intake. So this is because um, uh, reproductive cells, sperm and eggs, are really vulnerable to free radical damage. So free radicals are unstable um, molecules in the, the body um, and they can damage our cells, but particularly reproductive cells are really vulnerable to damage from, from free radicals. Um, but antioxidants are substances in our food that are um, protect cells from free radical damage. So vitamin C would be a very famous antioxidant and um, vitamin E, yeah. um, another really famous antioxidant. Um, but basically all plants right. are, are rich in antioxidants and antioxidants often give them the color. So other famous antioxidants would be beta carotene, the, the, the orange pigment in carrots, okay. um, or, uh, you know, the, they're, they're called anthocyanins, which are the bl uh, blue, purple, um, red pigments that are in berries, pomegranates. Um, blueberries, even um, like red onions, so that anything like red, purple color, um, pomegranates, really, really good source of, of, of these um, antioxidants. So basically like a, a diet that's abundant in um, like plants, um, lots of vegetables, olive oil, a fantastic source of antioxidants as well. You want to make oh, wow. sure green tea, um, dark chocolate even for like a little treat, a few squares of dark chocolate really good source of all those antioxidants so that is another area you want to be focusing on um, when you're trying to conceive as well spices um are probably one of the most concentrated source of dietary antioxidants so eating curries or um tagines like using turmeric cinnamon ginger okay. like try and have them a few times a week at least yeah. um, that will really up the antioxidant intake of your diet quite easily as well it's amazing, isn't it? My husband is half Iranian and I don't think I've ever saw a spice until I went round to his house because my mum just did not cook with them. Yeah. And then I went round to his house and I would just like smell these amazing smells every time I walked in the door and I was like, oh my God, what, what is that? And, and even if, for example, like you're, that's a really good example, like the Iranian, like Middle Eastern um, cuisine, because even if you don't like spicy food, like chilies or curries, you can have your tagines and things using cumin and you know those milder kind of spices that are more aromatic, but they're just as, as rich in your antioxidants. That's amazing. Um, I have a question here, actually, which I feel like feeds in with what we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. from uh, uh, Jazz, who um, is on Instagram, and she mm -hmm. messaged saying, how can vegetarian women who are trying for a baby get more B12 into their body? using food or would they have to supplement it well to be honest when you're trying to conceive i will always recommend for all my clients that they take a good um a preconceptual multivitamin which will have the b12 in it i just think 
it's one of the cases where I give every client a good multivitamin because I just think um, you really want to make sure you're not missing out on any of the micronutrients that you might need. Um, and these kind of fertility and um, preconceptional nutrients are, are developed to give you all of those. So it's, it's where I would, I, I would definitely be taking a preconceptual multivitamin that provides B12 anyway, um, even right. if you weren't vegetarian. Um, however, you know, as, as if you're vegetarian but not vegan, you can still have good quality um, animal products, although I would always choose organic um, simply because, uh, you know, just much more healthy um, organic animal, you know, animals that are re reared organically will not have been fed hormones or anything that might interfere with hormone balance for women. So, but organic eggs, fantastic um, source of B12 and a fantastic food actually when you're trying to conceive and during pregnancy um, for, for various reasons, eggs are really packed with, with nutrients that your body needs um, at those times. Um, or organic dairy products, like especially I love um, incorporating fermented dairy products into the diet, um, like kefir, um, organic yogurt, organic Greek yogurt, which is a really good source of protein if you're vegetarian. Um, so those sort of animal products, which will fit in with a vegetarian lifestyle, um, would also be a great source um, with sort of, uh, you know, a very holistic approach to to conception and reproductive health, we're also starting to understand a lot of importance about the gut microbiome. And even um, we're under, starting to understand that there's a vaginal microbiome. I actually work with a company called Nua Fertility, which are really kind of cutting edge um, nutrients, um, which are combined with probiotics, because we now know that we have, um, when you're trying to conceive, women have a vaginal microbiome, which is the good bacteria that are within our reproductive organs. And, and men also have like a, a microbiome in their reproductive organs as well. So these good bacteria um, are living in our, living all over our bodies now, mainly in our gut, also on our skin, in our mouths, um, but the, they're, they're also very important in our reproductive organs. So eating these fermented foods with the live bacteria is one of the best ways we can actually um, support this, this microbiome and that actually can support um, conception as well so really really that's a really interesting way we can also support fertility is that sort of because I know when you have thrush you have they say take loads of like of these yogurts with all these exactly. sort of, it's, it's sort of similar or put it out you know they say like to soak a tampax in yogurt as well yeah. and all these things and actually it's quite interesting that you I don't know if you discuss with a lot of women that they might get a, you know a UTI or thrush after taking an antibiotic and the reason is because you've actually take you've been wiping out, out. you've yeah. wiped out the good bacteria when you're killing off the infection it also can wipe out the good bacteria as well so um if you're if you're prone to thrush or utis it might be a kind of a bit of a alarm bell that you might not have a very you know a good balance of this good bacteria in the vaginal microbiome or maybe you know conditions like vaginal um bacteriosis and things like that all can be signs that maybe there's a bit of an imbalance down there. So you really want to focus on maybe in incorporating these fermented foods, these live bacteria foods into the diet. Okay, okay. So yeah. I would have, I didn't know whether it would be like, whether like nutritionally it would be like cut dairy out or it's like, is, is dairy a sort of a good thing or a bad thing? We get mixed, so many mixed reviews in regards to it. Yeah. But you're saying it, it's, it's good for sort of I know, the gut I, and things like that. Exactly. I know some people with, you know, maybe estrogen dominance are quite aware, you know, maybe conditions like endometriosis mm -hmm. will be cutting out dairy. But I actually think there are a lot of health benefits from dairy products. Now, if you're not lactose intolerant or don't have a dairy allergy, mm -hmm. um, you know, good quality organic dairy. There's a lot of evidence that it's, it's quite good for you. Um, and it's actually a really important dietary source of another nutrient that's really important for our um, reproductive health, iodine. A lot of women are iodine deficient and it's a really important nutrient for our fertility and conception. And during pregnancy, it's really, really, really important to have good levels of iodine and in, in good stores of iodine. So uh, dairy products are actually one of our, and, and eggs actually too, are, are really important sources of um of iodine so I, I don't tend to recommend cutting out dairy unless you have an intolerance or an allergy um, and um, the concerns about potentially dairy being a source of, of hormones 
um, if you're really suffering from hormone imbalances. I know a lot of people are concerned in that respect. Organic dairy is, is going to have less of that sort of exposure to hormones. Um, so if you're than, going to buy it, potentially go organic with it. Exactly, exactly. And if, I mean, if you are trying to cut it out, you might then, you know, want to sort of at least consult with someone who is a professional to make sure that you aren't missing out on kind of key nutrients that are, 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 are present in dairy. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I personally don't drink a lot of milk because it doesn't agree with me. Yeah, it doesn't so agree I will with have, me. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the reason dairy, milk particularly doesn't agree with a lot of people is because it's a very high lactose content. So it can, you know, do too much lactose, even if you're not lactose intolerant, will produce gut symptoms in a lot of people. Um, but don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that all other dairy products won't agree with you. I mean, particularly um, kefir, I think is a fantastic um, food to, to incorporate in our diet. Um, I've never had that. I've never had that. Yeah, it's like a, it would be almost like a, an Eastern European form of buttermilk. I've seen it. I've yeah. seen it. I've just, I just haven't bought it. Yeah, it's a fab, you know, you can use it with like your oats, like to make overnight oats or, you know, add it to smoothies. Or some people just like to drink it as it is. It's like a kind of, it's, it's, it's fermented. So it has like a little bit of a fizzy feel on the tongue, but it's like a fizzy yogurt drink, which sounds a bit odd, but it's actually really nice. So if you're a fan of yogurt, you will like it. And it's actually a really potent source of, of good bacteria. And um, so that might be something to consider. I said, if you're, even if you, you get symptoms when you have milk, it doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't have yogurt uh, or kefir because, um, the levels of lactose are actually quite low in yogurt and kefir. It's been pre-digested by the good bacteria there, so it's pretty much nil. Um, and you can have hard cheeses, you can have, you know, unpasteurized cheeses are also really good for our gut bacteria. So, um, and the microbiome in the body. So as I said, there's there's health benefits from dairy as well. And I, I don't agree with, you know, you, you find a lot of maybe kind of influencers on social media that basically tell everyone that they have to go dairy free and that's you know mm. nutrition isn't one size fits all it's personalized so yes some people do better off dairy and some people won't and I think that's you know the one size fits all diet doesn't exist you know yeah definitely I used to I know this is definitely too much information but I used to get brushed like mm -hmm. probably once a year and it used to just drive me up the freaking wall and as oh. soon as I gave up dairy milk it just stopped it, I, I'm fine with yogurt but if yeah I'm, it's can't drink dairy milk it's funny the dairy can actually be quite high in sugar so the lactose sugar that we're talking about yeah it is actually a sugar so that could have been right. possibly feeding feeding that and and you know imbalancing that because yeah, yeah. it, it feeds off sugar yeah it does I, I i was reading up on it to absolutely high heaven and it's all the things you like you can't have exactly um, bread but all these things you're saying for, for sort of getting ready to conceive and that it it they're good in they're good precursors and sort of that they're getting you ready for pregnancy aren't they they're warming mm -hmm. you up to I mean I don't drink alcohol now and if I'm honest that was just purely because I stopped drinking alcohol when I was pregnant and then I stopped drinking alcohol when I was breastfeeding and mm -hmm. then I felt like that went on for about four years with two kids and then I was like yeah. I actually miss it and I feel no. so healthier yeah so exactly and you know you you get used to socializing without it um, yeah you know. yeah your designated driver and yeah I think I'm just always worried as well like if something goes wrong I just want to be able to drive or sort something out but yeah um, exactly right what also I mean this is a selfish question because it's something that I want to know <laughs> so in terms of how our nutritional needs differ from mm -hmm. men because I find I do all the cooking at home so my husband mm -hmm. eats what I make mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what do I need or what are the differences between us that I need to be aware of in terms of what I need that he might not need or okay. vice versa yeah that's really interesting oh I mean a few things we've actually already covered like we've talked a little bit about how iodine is really important for women yeah. and that's you know um where do you mm -hmm. get that from where do you get where do you get iodine so, from yeah so um is that something you have to so, oh right so it's associated with the sea so like um seaweed would be a source like a lot of people okay. eat seaweed um shellfish like maybe prawns mussels can mm. be a good source eggs are a good source as well um strawberries and then dairy products would be your main sources of iodine right but okay. I said it's, it is a common deficiency and um so it's um if you are trying to conceive i would always take a supplement that contains iodine um and just make sure if you're buying you know uh 
a multivitamin, you might want to make sure there's some iodine in there too. So that would be, you know, something to always be on the lookout for. But I mean, for a short like answer. I feel like it's a good idea to get a blood test, actually. Sort of when you're sort of looking to potentially yeah. see like, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that to an extent in that some nutrients like that are really important will show up in a blood test, like, you know, the folate, uh, folic acid or um, iron and B12. All of those will show up in a blood test because those are nutrients that are present in the blood. And, um, yeah. you know, however, some nutrients like are not necessarily easy to measure okay. in the bloodstream. So, you know, bear that in mind. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. you know, like, for example, like iodine might not be actually a very accurate measurement by your bloodstream. Okay. Um, or, you know, some other nutrients like magnesium, calcium, you can't always actually measure your levels in blood. But I mean, it's always worthwhile having a, you know, a blood screen done with your GP anyway. But just let you know, that screen won't actually show up some of these other key nutrients that you might sort of be low in. So okay. Okay. Um, that's something. But um, like in terms of foods that women should be eating and, and yeah. approaches to our diet, Mm -hmm. that are that are different to men I mean it all comes down to our hormones and how basically our hormones from like basically adolescence through our 20s through our you know the 30s you know trying to get pregnant and then having babies and then postnatal and then perimenopausal in our late 30s and then going late 30s and 40s and then getting to menopause I mean basically you know it's th throughout that life cycle our hormones can basically interfere with our energy levels give us headaches and then on top of that if you add on like pms you know pmt endometriosis pcos um oh my god when you, know, you say it out loud it's just it's insane huge, isn't it exactly and you know and and even if you don't have those condi any of those conditions you know the fluctuations in hormones across the month can can affect how you feel if you're you know can can make you you know at certain points in your cycle you might be more prone to a migraine you might yeah be i get migraine every day before my period i have exactly. like awful yeah. awful migraine yeah because when estrogen drops before your period like that can that's a trigger for migraine so it's you know really oh, interesting yeah and um or you know you might be more prone to anxiety or feeling just a bit off you know yeah. depending on what your hormones are doing so I always say like it's really key to eat for hormonal balance yeah um, so what Sarah just to quickly interrupt you there I actually had a question from mm -hmm. a lady called Tor and she mm -hmm. said exactly this she she wanted to know um how what how should we change our food during our monthly cycles to help to help us mitigate that um to be honest like I would be more I would be more taking the approach of just like eating sort of for hormone balance okay, hormone balance. So okay i wouldn't necessarily think oh i have to eat differently during my monthly cycle one thing i would be aware of is that during your monthly cycle and just before it can actually affect your your blood sugar levels and your you know so you're actually more likely to um have blood sugar imbalances and crave sugar so i always say you know that craving for chocolate and stuff around the time of your period it is actually physical it's coming from the hormonal imbalances at that time and, and is that because we're just low on sugar that we want sugar or and you're I'm more likely to have the blood sugars kind of up and down and get these kind of dips in blood sugar um and have like these kind of imbalances in blood sugar so you, you try and eat especially around the time like just before and during your period try and eat with that in mind so you do try if you can and avoid sugar because the more you eat the more that sort of blood sugar like vicious cycle you're going to be in this vicious cycle of blood sugar spikes and drops oh my so goodness really i did not know this i am always squirreling off to the kitchen and opening the mm -hmm. cupboard and having a little tube of chocolate without anyone knowing yeah so well i not doing it what i would do is if you could like swap that during your period for like a few squares of dark chocolate but have it together with some nuts like a handful of nuts for some yeah i mean i only i only to be fair i only do eat dark chocolates yeah so I'm um, with, with well-being but when you're having your period and in the days just before try and eat in a way that will keep your blood sugar really stable so okay. don't skip meals okay. um try and have protein rich meals and snacks so um have a protein rich breakfast um so or have protein with breakfast so don't have toast and jam, have toast with your eggs maybe, or Greek yogurt with oats, 
and mm -hmm. berries, you know, something like that. So you or have maybe um, like some seeds and nuts sprinkled over your porridge. Yeah. Try and always get protein and 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 for snacks, you know, grabbing that handful of nuts is really great. Mm -hmm. Um, don't be just eating and don't be like, you know, skipping meals and having a coffee because that's going to cause your blood sugar to be all over the place. Be really yeah. mindful that you want to be making sure you're you're not going too long between meals. Yeah and that you're having balanced meals that have that and always have that element of protein. So, um, you know, eggs, Greek yogurt, nuts and seeds. Yeah, I feel that Sarah, when I, when I, I used to work really, really, uh, I used to work in an office now I'm from home, but when I worked in an office, I would be like there till like nine o'clock and then I would find myself not eating for a really long stretch of the time and it mm -hmm. would just completely floor me. And I would just be like, I feel like I could keep going, keep going, keep going, but then the next day yeah. I'd be completely useless. Yeah, because you're just like running on adrenaline or caffeine potentially. Yeah, and you well, just you know? right. It's just about maintaining that sort of mm -hmm. stability, that level where you yeah. know you're actually going to, you know, it's not not too high, not too low. You know, just yeah. okay, brilliant. Exactly. But in, in terms like of like, sorry, go on. You were no, say. if you want like just a general approach for like how to eat for hormone balance. So yeah, I would always say like it's phytoestrogens. So there's a class of food which are called phytoestrogens, which are plants that can mimic estrogen in our body. Um, wow. But they mimic estrogen in a healthy way. So they keep, they help to balance out the activity of estrogen in our bodies. So okay. if estrogen's too high, they can help to balance that out. If estrogen's too low, they can balance that out too. So what, what um, food is this, Sarah? Tell me, tell me. So you've got um, flax seeds are kind of number one. They're like really wow, okay. great source of flax seeds. Um, and that can, flax seeds actually are in clinical trials have been shown to help like PMS, menopause symptoms. So it's a really good food to incorporate either like putting it over your, your breakfast. Get it in your cereal, porridge. Porridge, yeah, exactly. Overnight oats, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't actually like them, you can hide them in stews or soups and things, kind of like um, the milled, the milled flaxseed. Okay. Um, That's lots one of them, actually. Yeah, beans and lentils. So yep. like hummus. Mm -hmm. Lentils, those are great sources of phytoestrogens. Um, sweet potatoes. Pomegranates are quite yeah. good. Um, I like for hormone balance. So all those kind of key foods incorporated. So I was doing a post about pomegranate the other day. It's just like an all round superfood, isn't and, it? Yeah, and particular roles for like female hormone balance. So it's really, really brilliant um, in, in supporting female hormone balance. Like, you know, try and incorporate it. Okay, as okay. Much as you can. It's, okay. it's really, really great. Um, so those phytoestrogen rich foods, I mean, like try and have some beans and lentils mm -hmm. every day. I see a lot of people like a lot of my clients have really good diets, but I don't think a lot of people eat enough beans and lentils. And they're like, they're so good for our health, especially female health. They're cheap. You mm. know, you can, they're versatile. You can, you know, you can have them and, you know. I think a lot of people don't know how to cook them. Yeah. I, I think that I, I might do something on that actually, because yeah. I had a lentil Salads, on the face tonight. Um, yeah. Or like hummus, you know, even if it's just hummus or bean dips. Having mm. those in the fridge for snacking, it's, it's great. Um, so your phytoestrogen rich foods, I would say phytoestrogens and then the broccoli family are okay. key. So the broccoli family of um, that family of vegetables, which includes broccoli, kale, mm. rocket, um, radishes, mm. um, what else, pak choy, um, uh, purple sprouting broccoli, that, that whole family of veg. They are specifically key for female health because they contain a substance called indole-3-carbonyl um, and it actually helps our body to detoxify estrogen and rebalance our estrogen levels. Um, so what's really interesting to understand about estrogen is that our body produces it, but then detoxifies it like as if it's a toxin. So it wants, it wants our body wants to use the estrogen and then get rid of it. So, um, the, and and in that process of getting rid of it, sometimes some women aren't as good at it as others. And this kind of metabolism and breakdown, you can actually end up producing um, more kind of dangerous or negative kind of estrogens that might be associated with conditions like endometriosis. Um, or, you know, you can be really good at, at, at detoxifying estrogen. But these kind of compounds that are in broccoli, the broccoli family, they actually help our body to get rid of that estrogen and in a healthy way. So I would say women should be having like, uh, you know, a one veg from that broccoli family, like a serving every day if you can. And it doesn't have to be 
you know, you don't have to always cook broccoli every day. It could be rocket in a salad, some radishes in a salad, you know, a stir fry with pak choy, you know, and, and if you can do that on a regular basis, that's a really powerful way to support female health and hormone balance. And that will, if you're doing that regularly, you don't want to just do it on the days of your period. You want to do it every single day as much as possible. So then that will have a cumul cumulative effect on your, your hormone balance. Sarah, you're so clever. This is just unbelievable. Like, it's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. it's just, but it's, it's, it's such, it's, you know, it's, it's so interesting if you look into it, like the, the, you know, these compounds that are there, these, and, you know, and it's not like if your husband eats them that they would have any damaging effect. It's just, yeah. that you, so you can cook these for the whole family, but it's just as women, you're going to get that real benefit from having those in your diet. That is absolutely amazing. I mean, I buy four packets of broccoli a week. I think everyone thinks I'm obsessed with broccoli. And now mm -hmm. I know why. I think yeah. it's my body telling me. It's kind yeah. of, yeah, it's like instinct. You know, I, I, I always think, you know, even like when it comes to like pregnancy and postpartum, you trust your cravings. If there's a food yeah. you really crave, yeah. go get it, like eat it. Because, you know, it's, there's a good chance that um, it's, your body wants it for a reason, you know? Yeah, it's, it's trying to tell you something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of um, energy, mm -hmm. energy, it's come up quite a lot with some of these questions. I think for a lot of um, people that are pregnant, especially, mm -hmm. it, obviously you're just tired. And then when you've got a newborn, you're yeah. absolutely shattered. And I've also had another question from Tor again, who said about, you know, energy boosting ideas that are not caffeine and are not sugar. Yeah. Do we well, I mean, coming back to that sort of eating to keep your blood sugar stable, um, yeah. that is really, really key. So, you know, be mindful of having a protein source with each meal. Um, right, okay. Using, but it's the protein you know, that's going to give the energy. It, what protein does is that, so generally the energy will come from our blood sugar, which will come mainly from your carbohydrate okay. um, source. So, you know, your, your bread, your pasta, your rice, your oats, your potatoes, things like that. Um, you what you were saying you don't want to spike that you want to you don't want that to table. spike in and don't skyrocket go, so go brown don't go white exactly um so choose whole grain versions so you get slow release i mean in my opinion oats are probably one of the best ones so like you know oat cakes porridge overnight oats granolas made with oats are fantastic but when you combine a source of protein like eggs you know greek yogurt um mm -hmm. meat fish um, even your beans and lentils are your source of, of, of um, protein. If you realize you're actually not hungry mm. until maybe like three or four in the afternoon, you can kind of keep going on those breakfasts much longer. Or you're like, Do you know what? I'm not really that hungry for lunch. I'll have like a small snack because you've filled up on a much more substantial protein based breakfast. You're having a much more sustained release of energy. So you're not experiencing those dips. Right. So try and do that. Definitely. Um, you know, have your protein with every meal and snack, watch out for, yeah, you know, like you're saying, caffeine and sugar, especially if you feel low and you reach for the caffeine and sugar, it's going to make you feel great for a very short period of time, but you're going to find yourself like back down again. Yeah, um, we know it though, don't we? You know, when yeah. you're doing it, you, you know yeah. that it's so good, but you're just like, oh, yeah, I I mean, it, if but... you can even, you know, you get maybe more of a nicer kind of energy boost from a cup of green tea. There's yeah. still caffeine there, but it's it's less likely to make you feel jittery and horrible. Um, and I mean, again, coming back to beans and lentils, they're great for that sustained release of energy because um, beans and lentils are actually a great com combination of carbs, protein, and fiber. So the release of energy from those kinds of um, foods is really sustained. Mm. So trying to do that. Yeah. I mean, also I do really believe like in the postpartum period if you're breastfeeding and you know really important to drink lots of water yeah so. this is something as well that is really important because mm -hmm. you I, I feel like the concentration is on the female when she's pregnant and then when the baby's born it's all on the baby and actually you don't have time just, for yourself I know you don't have time for yourself and you're going through so much emotionally mm -hmm. and physically and actually, you really need to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, like what you were saying, you were saying drink loads of water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's really key, um, especially if you're breastfeeding because, you, you know, you get dehydrated really easily. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the, the, the body will always prioritize the baby. So it will always produce the milk, even, you know, even if it has to dehydrate your body. Um, 
so yeah, so that's really. Yeah, I, I went to the doctor when I after I gave birth and um and I had my bloods done and they were like, you are low in this, this, and this, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh my god, I'm so panicked. What about you know my baby, my baby? And they were like, listen, don't worry, he's taking everything. He's, yeah, he's paying. You, you know, that's left with nothing. Exactly. So the body's smart they, and also you know continue to take your 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 multivitamins. You know mm -hmm. even when you're breastfeeding because that's really important, um especially because. Um, obviously your breast milk has a lot of calcium in it yeah. um, for the baby's um, you know bone um, skeletal development and teeth development and everything so um, women can actually become very low in calcium during the during pregnancy and the postpartum period as well so it's really really important to make sure that you, you continue taking your your multi to mm. keep supporting Which you know why we end up needing to go to the dentist isn't it yeah yeah exactly. or, you know, people get really sensitive teeth and things like yeah. that as well so really important to, you know and even if it is you know simple things like taking good a good multivitamin um you know that's a really important way to keep looking after yourself when you don't have much time you know to I, I was taking my folic acid when I was all the way through my pregnancy and then I stopped when the baby was mm -hmm. born and then when I went and had my blood test they were like because oh, I, I I literally said I feel like I'm falling asleep just standing up mm -hmm. <laughs> like your folic acid is literally on the floor yeah like, it's and and it was such a realization for me that actually when you're breastfeeding and after you've given birth you're just as in need of all those new all those nutrients all those vitamins so yeah it's definitely something that i think women need and, to be aware of you know i i had more time to cook for myself when i was pregnant and yeah and then like in in the first few weeks of breastfeeding you know it's it's hard to actually if you're by yourself in the house and there's no one yeah. to help you prepare a meal it's really really difficult to get yeah. balanced meals you might find yourself just grabbing snacks because you know you go to make something and you have to rush the baby I feel like it's the biggest gift that family can do when you just give birth is to turn up with a tray of food yeah or lasagna or something yeah like one of my dear friends did that for me and she turned up with a whole tray of food and I literally nearly cried because yeah she just, knew exactly what you yeah, needed. Yeah, just exactly. And it, and it was healthy and it was good for me. And like, it was definitely something I wish I'd done. I wish I'd just frozen a load of rice, frozen mm -hmm. a load of stuff so that that first week, couple of weeks, mm -hmm. I had food, good food ready to go because you are yeah. craving good food as well, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. You do. Um, and you, and you, but you also need carbs as well. So, you know, it's important not to try and lose weight too quickly and go car, you know, go low carb because when you're breastfeeding you do need the carbohydrates in your diet too so just try and choose those kind of slow release ones like brown rice oats yeah. um you know a baked potato with the skin is great you know and a really good lunch too so you know things like that are really really key yeah yeah definitely um oh, one moment i've just got this uh, uh thing here so um um oh you're right yeah i have a question here so in terms of offering a piece of advice um in terms of switching from one product to another, what could, what, if, if three bits of advice you could offer uh, a household from switching but, from uh, one product to like another? Changes that you would do? Yeah. Um, do. Just simple things, I think. Okay. But, like breakfast cereals, gone. Like just swap to oats or, you know, like really just whole food, quite plain cereals that you can jazz up with maybe right. fresh fruit or just love honey. Like breakfast cereals are essentially like they're probably one of the biggest cons of, you know, that really we're encouraged that those are healthy. Um, it's really, you know, like dessert for breakfast, essentially. So, um, you know, just have a look at the sugar content and some of the ingredients that are in those. Yes, they're, they're fortified with vitamins, but the reason they're fortified is because they've been using such refined, you know, ingredients to begin with that don't actually have a lot of nutrients left. And also, I mean, if it's kids, you know you know you're essentially giving your child a, if it's a sweet cereal or chocolatey cereal you're essentially giving your child a dessert and then sending them to school and expecting them to concentrate when like we we would struggle um you know having had that much sugar so if you're thinking about blood sugar balance they're the worst way to start the day they set you off with like this blood sugar spike which is essentially going to then drop you know so um you so you'll be then craving sugar again later on in the day so you know swap go back to things like you know whole grain toast and peanut butter you know e eggs if you've got time you know porridge overnight oats i mean um if you if you are going to buy a cereal make sure it's like just a really basic whole grain like oats or weedabix or oatabix or something like that that doesn't have added sugar because even bran flakes 
have got loads of sugar. That's fine. They taste really Mine's good. Light. Mm -hmm. There's loads of I added sugar. That. Yeah, if you I have mean, a I don't eat brown cakes anymore, but I used to buy them years mm -hmm. ago. Because you think they're really healthy, but yeah, so. Yeah, they taste like rubbish and you feel like you're doing yourself a service. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I've definitely, that would be breakfast cereal. Swap your breakfasts. That's probably one of the best things you can do, you know, for your overall energy levels and overall health. Because if you start off the day better and your blood sugar is more stable, you're going to make healthier choices then throughout the whole day. Yeah, um, you know, right. just naturally because your blood sugar is more stable and you're, you're going to be less likely to crave, um, you know, more sugar later on. Mm -hmm. um, I guess another one that's not like food related, I would actually really encourage people, especially women, or you're trying to conceive, swap out your cleaning products, you know, oh, wow. um, yeah, like go for natural cleaning products. Um, because, oh, Sarah, I love this. I love this yeah, information. You know, like um, air fresheners. Um, you know, a lot of the, the chemicals that are in a lot of your cleaning products can actually be, um, you know, either can be hormone imbalancers, can actually be kind of chemicals that will um, imbalance our hormone. So women, we're, as women, we're exposed to a lot of like substances in either our diet um, through like um, things like pesticides um, or plastics like BPA. Um, that are actually we call them like xenoestrogens so these are like um, foreign estrogens that are actually getting into our bodies um, from the environment so right. in terms of dietary sources it would be like pesticides okay. and non-organic food they can act so these can these these chemicals can actually mimic estrogen but in a bad way so they can really imbalance our our, our women's like hormonal health um, they're in um, and we're the ones we're the ones using the cleaning products exactly more than men for far more so the, the, our main exposure to that would be like in our food and pesticides or in plastics in our food or in um cleaning products or even in some of our cosmetics as well so so really look at your cleaning products try and try and use like natural ones as much as possible um use microfiber like buy non-toxic cleaning products for your house or buy microfiber cloths where you maybe don't even need to use a, a cleaning product with it you can just use it with water Okay. um try and do that as much as possible like supermarkets are now on to this as well and they, they actually have quite a good range now of non-toxic um cleaning um products for your house so it's not even that difficult um i was actually watching a dragon's den the other day and there's this oh i love dragon's den you no know, and there was actually a, a a company that came on and i can't remember their name but it was like they've got this new range of cleaning products that are non-toxic and actually you just buy like a tablet and mm -hmm. you you dissolve it in water and then you okay. know and so you're actually reducing plastic usage because you just refill the same container every month so that's a really good way um air fresheners so there's a, a um there's a chemical called phthalates which we know is actually um very negative for female health but also very can actually negatively impact reproduction and phthalates would be in um uh, oh, air fresheners well, and air fresheners so try and use natural air fresheners. Like one of my big changes that I made was I bought like a lovely um, ultrasonic um, essential oil diffuser okay. um, where you put in water and then you can just put in your natural essential oils. And that is a really good way to kind of, to, to, as an alternative to air fresheners, you can use like maybe lemon essential oil or orange or, you know, any of them that you like. And that really is a, makes a nice smell in the house, but without the toxins that might be in air fresheners as well. So that would be a big change. That that's, that's a big tip. That's a oh, really big switch. Yeah, oh, that's really me. helpful. And then okay, another before switch. We, before we do our last one, yeah. Sarah, if there's anyone that's watching that wants to ask a question that I haven't already asked, just raise your hand and I will see if I can find where I can see the raised hands. But um, yeah, if there is anyone that wants to ask a question that I haven't addressed, please just raise your hand and then or write it in the chat. And then we can do that. But yeah, sorry, Sarah, last one. And, and then last one, as I would just say, is even like try and do um, like a vegetarian meal at least once a week. So try and get away from, you know, basing our meals around meat or yeah. thinking we need to have meat every night of the week, you know. It's a uh, mindset shift, isn't it? Because yeah. I was brought up like um, it was very sort of meat and two bed, meat and two exactly. bed. And if I didn't have meat on the plate, it felt like I wasn't having a dinner. Yeah. I felt like there was something missing. And now I don't eat meat. I mean, I eat some fish, but I feel mm -hmm. like 
but that's that's quite rare it's probably once a week maybe mm, once yeah a week. and it's like you're saying like when you were growing up meat was the main event on the plate yeah. every night yeah. yeah exactly so it's like you know you you chose what meat you were going to have and then your vegetables and things were like an afterthought yeah that, whereas I actually would say yeah. you know try and think you know base your meal around your veg and then if you're even going to have meat mm. have this little bit like but have it almost like the side order you know mm. like that little kind of bit on the side of your plate because that's going to be enough yeah you know yeah. this whole idea that we need to base our meal around a big slab of meat even mm. if it's like chicken you know so and if you try and you know have even if you're not vegetarian try and have vegetarian meals a few nights a week mm. um one night a week even just to start off with um or vegetarian lunches because you're going to up your veg intake very easily that way but also it's about changing your taste buds mm. you know how you like to eat um you know introduce new you know different veg introduce more variety into your diet which is also really important when, um, I, when I went traveling I met this girl and she said to me look she said even if you just switch up your meat so that you buy organic meat because yeah. it's expensive you'll eat less of it which mm-hmm, exactly, exactly what I did so I started buying organic meat and then I started and then I was like well I can't, I can't do this every night so no. I went down to like it was a special occasion so it was like mm-hmm. twice a week and then it went down to once a week and then exactly. it was a slow progression so I think like what you're saying is right just incorporate that veggie meal maybe once a week then twice exactly, a week. yeah and you're saying like spend money on better quality meat it's yeah. going to taste better it's going to be better for you and you're saying like yes I would say organic meat or wild game like venison is also really really good for you or you know even if it's not organic because some farms are producing really good quality meat but they don't pay you know they they can't afford to pay for the organic certification you know so even if there's like a farm shop near you that there were or you know a farm where they're producing really good grass-fed beef or grass-fed meats Mm -hmm. you know they might not be certified organic but they're still going to be much much better for you if you can eat grass fed um, yeah that's a pretty good point actually because you know, that, so, that organic yeah. certification is not easy so yeah I imagine that yeah local farm uh, shops and things like that would mm-hmm. be you okay. know and if, if if they're producing good quality meats you know if you ask questions about how you know are these meats grass fed you know they should be able to answer those questions mm-hmm. you know so you know don't be afraid to ring up and go you know or how are your animals fed or you know if it is a farm shop that- exactly yeah 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 I, I feel like sometimes as women we feel like we can't we can't ask the uncomfortable questions you feel, you feel like you're annoying people yeah I used to feel like that I remember I started like calling around the butchers and things and I was like having a chat with them and I do you do feel like the annoying customer yeah. but you have to do it you have to you know exactly. you have to ask the questions because you know it's really important um, but I'm conscious of time so there's a couple of uh, a few more questions that I just wanted to ask you mm-hmm. I was brought up with a mother who boiled everything mm-hmm. <laughs> she boiled everything so when I sort of started cooking for myself or going around to my husband's and they're like vegetables were crunchy I was like what is this <laughs> so how would you recommend cooking your food and is how we cook it important definitely like it's definitely important and you're making a really good point that if you're boiling your vegetables and especially boiling them within an inch of their life you know, <laughs> you're 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 destroying a lot of the nutrients that are in there vitamin c is very heat sensitive so any vitamin c that's in those vegetables it's water soluble and heat sensitive so it will leach out into the cooking water um whereas your b vitamins are also um you know in your folate that's all water soluble so that will be then leaving the vegetables and going into the water that you're cooking them in so unless you're going to use that water to maybe make a sauce or anything it's you know you've lost those nutrients um however like you know if you make in winter though soups and stews are a really good way to get around that because if you're cooking soups or stews you know they're still healthy because you're essentially eating the water that the veg are cooked in so you know that's a health that's still a healthy way of you know even though you've maybe boiled or cooked the, the the veg in in water at high temperatures but yeah definitely like vegetables either you know even baked or roasted veg is still you're still going to contain more of the nutrients or you know steaming and you don't even necessarily have to buy an expensive steamer even just by like putting a bit of water in the bottom of the saucepan and clamping on the lid mm-hmm. the veg will steam in there as well you know you don't have to fill the, the water up to the top um and as I said, yeah even if you don't have a steamer just give it a go a few times it works really really well especially like you said with broccoli mm-hmm. um, and things like that so yeah for for sure cooking in that way and 
um, and then have a mix of of raw and cooked veg. You know, try and have you know some raw maybe. Yeah. Uh, from time that's to time, true. salads and things, and that's a good way. You know, even if it's having salads or mm. even chopping up some raw carrots or radishes or peppers mm. or, or celery or cucumber and snacking on those maybe with hummus. I have a friend from um, from Switzerland and I uh, flew out there to see her and um, it's like rather than having like you know how we've got like the pizza hut buffets here mm -hmm. they've got like super food salad buffets like everywhere mm -hmm. and it's all yeah. raw mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they can go and they've got a plate and they're putting all this raw veg on their plate and they're all just like tucking in like it's like yeah. a pizza hut buffet and mm -hmm. I was like wow my gosh, I feel like it was the first time that I was like, oh my gosh, you can really eat raw veg and everyone's like digging in and loving it. Yeah. I've never done that before, you know? So it's is, something, but I, I put find, in my salads. Yeah, exactly. But I find, I find like in countries like, you know, France or Switzerland or Italy, you know, they eat the veg, but you know, they also kind of give it attention and care. Mm. You know, they don't just go, oh, here's some veg and they throw it on the plate and go, you know, and then, you know, no wonder, you know, people don't enjoy their veg, you know? dress it with like a lovely olive oil and lemon juice dressing mm. you know, or maybe like a tahini dressing or something and oh, I love tahini don't get me yeah. started with tahini yeah. I love tahini you know and, and and actually when you serve your vegetables with like a fat a fatty dressing even you know when you make a roast dinner that knob of butter so a lot of the nutrients that are in your vegetables are actually fat soluble so when I, I talked really early on when we started chatting about antioxidants yeah. A lot of antioxidants are actually fat soluble compounds. So right. to absorb them well, we actually need to eat them with some fat. Okay. So um, you know, uh that knob of butter thrown in with like your steamed carrots and broccoli actually helps you to absorb the, the antioxidants in those vegetables. Or having your salads with your olive oil dressing, or even, you know, if you're not a fan of butter, you know, drizzling olive oil over this, this is the best news you've, this is the best news you've told me all hour mm -hmm. I don't feel guilty now about that butter with my uh with my carrots mm -hmm. exactly yeah that little bit of butter it's actually going to help you absorb the nutrients from those from the veg so it's really you know and sometimes when you find out when you study nutrition you find out that things that we've that are traditionally done like mm -hmm. traditional practices like putting that butter with the veg or you dress themselves with olive oil actually make it healthier you know so it's like you know yeah. sometimes our instincts whereas you know in the 80s and 90s when people were dieting and it was like oh we need to be low low fat low fat yeah. and we're eating salads without a dressing mm. you're actually going to absorb less of the nutrients from those veg because you're eating it without a fat oh my gosh I did yeah. not know you this is so insightful Sarah thank you yeah, so, just, so much it is I, just want to quick, I just want to quickly check Facebook I just want to make sure that I haven't got my 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 computer's been buzzing, so I just want to make sure that there isn't Question. anything here that I've missed in terms of uh, questions. I'm hoping that we're going live on Facebook. If not, I will just put up this recording where I can't see anything. Okay, let me come back to you. Okay, so I've got last couple of questions because we're one minute to nine. So what's your all-time favorite superfood, Sarah? And what is your favorite dinner to make for your family? Okay, um, all-time superfood, it's actually, I don't have a really straightforward answer. Sorry. I don't have <laughs> because like the thing is, when you start to look at each individual fruit or vegetable and look at what's in it, yeah. you'll find out that so many are superfoods. You know, it's really hard to say, you know, and sometimes it's yeah. like trendy one time, one day, one year it's kale, the next it's something else, next it's goji berries. And I think it's more about having a variety of mm. foods, definitely. Mm. At the moment, though, I'm really fascinated with the health benefits of mushrooms and getting more mushrooms into the diet. Um, oh, wow. Lots, actually, I should have said lots of really interesting antioxidants, like in especially like shiitake mushrooms and all those, like trying to have stir fries or mushrooms on toast is like mushrooms on like sourdough bread. It's a lovely like little recipe for, you know, a quick and easy supper or brunch or something. Um, so really interesting. And in you know, even how we can use certain mushrooms medicinally, that's like a really emerging area of sort of nutritional science. So definitely um, shiitake mushrooms would probably be my favorite at the moment. <laughs> um, at the moment. We'll ask you exactly. next month and I'm sure it will be something else. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And then in terms of um, sort of my favorite dinner, mm. I, I guess I don't have like a straightforward answer. Again, mm. I would say there's like things that I make regularly is 
I will regularly make kind of like a Spanish style omelette frittata where I'm making like, you know, a big, nice omelette with like lots of different vegetables cooked through it. Yeah, I'm going to um, do one of these on my, I do these cook with me's once a week uh -huh. and I'm going to do that because I yeah. do feel like that's such a great dinner or exactly. even like and, a lunch. You know, it's great for a family because you can have yeah. that and then maybe have like a nice salad alongside it or some extra veg or you can put potatoes in it or you can leave the potatoes out depending on what you're doing and and if or if you're just making it for yourself for one person you can have leftovers it's lovely cold the next day for lunch like you can incorporate it into your lunch so that's great um or another one that I also I'm making tonight actually is like I get a packet of like supermarket tortellini and okay. I cook um like a lot of green veg like courgettes asparagus peas spinach um in like uh, I I I make that in like kind of a, into a brothy soup, almost like a minestrone. And then at the very last minute, I add the tortellini mm -hmm. and it becomes almost like a minestrone soup with like lots of green veg and the, the pasta. Mm -hmm. um, and then like a bit of Parmesan cheese on top of that or some pesto, like a dollop of pesto. So that would be, and it's a great way because you're getting like a, like a huge amount of veg in, yeah. in like you're getting loads of portions. And then like lastly, it's like almost like a, like a bit of a feast of like a mezze, like antipasto, like, I'll do like maybe some boiled eggs, roasted peppers, some salads, a grate some carrots, maybe some char grilled courgettes, like that kind of a feast of like lots of different veg. I do that at the end of every week. I yeah. literally go through like my cupboards and all the vegetables that I haven't used mm -hmm. and just throw everything into like a baking tray and then just yeah. stick it in with a load of like Italian herbs with a bit of olive okay. oil. Or you can do like a tahini dressing or, you know, and serve that maybe even with like some nice sourdough bread or something, a little bit of that, or, mm. you know, um, a bit of a pasta salad or something. And, and that like, and it's like, you know, you've got this big spread, you know, yeah. to enjoy. There's lots of variety on the table, um, but you don't realize that you're eating like maybe four or five portions of vegetables, you know, in, in your, your meal that night, you know. So it's a great way to get, you know, other family members who maybe aren't eating well at lunchtime. When yeah. they work, you know, they can come home and you're making sure they're getting the, you know, they're meeting their kind of needs for their vegetables. Yeah, absolutely. I did have some questions about kids, but I don't know whether we should maybe schedule another time to do we'll something do, like, like that. Focus on kids a bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause I feel like that thing today. Yeah. I feel like that as well. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Sarah. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. This has yeah. been amazing. I so, so helpful. Fun. And I just want to say a thanks to all the everyone that asked questions and sent all those job boards in. Mm -hmm. So Harla, I hope we, um, I think we sort of addressed your question at the beginning when we were talking all about sort of how to conceive and all those top tips there. So that was, mm -hmm. I think Sarah really sort of dived into that and we sort of, um, I mean, there was some great stuff there, Sarah, wasn't there? I'm going to rewatch all of that. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your oh, time this evening. And um, I know you've just had your little one as well. So I hope you're, I hope you're doing as you say and uh, yeah. taking care of yourself because I know yeah. it's, it's intense, isn't it? The first, uh... I mean, you know, I, I, you know, even I had the days whenever I, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, opened the packet of chocolate chip biscuits. So I know how it makes you feel like you feel good for about half an hour and then, you know, you but they, they call out to you <laughs> whenever. <laughs> they do. It doesn't stop. It's so addictive. Sugar is so addictive. Like at Christmas, I completely like, oh my gosh, I turn into like a sugar monster. Mm -hmm. And then like, I found it really difficult to get back into my routine. In January. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Actually, because that, that, that addiction lingers. Yeah. So you need to do the sugar detox in January. Yeah. I, and it's even a while. I have to do it too. I have to do it too. Because yeah. you know, in January, you're like, hmm, I need it. I need a biscuit today or I need some chocolate. Yeah. And you're like, why is it, that? And you're like, yeah. It takes about two months to like get get it out of your system mm -hmm. and then like you're kicking yourself for coming so far off of like track with like eating well so definitely yeah. Christmas I'm gonna I'm gonna ease up on the banoffee pie that's for freaking mm -hmm. sure so um thanks so much Sarah thanks so much I'll let you get on now me. thank you again so much. Such a pleasure. you're so smart and I'm so grateful so take care bye mm -hmm.